Thank you. All right. And this is great. We're starting about a minute early because I have a lot to cover. As Manuel said, we're going to be talking about communication hacks. So let's dive right in. Oh, okay, here, takes a moment to load. All right, as uh, some of you may already know me from my time at the GNOME board and from general open source community things, but I am currently a senior open source program manager at GitLab. My name is Noritzi Sanchez. And communication and collaboration is something that is really key to the work that I do. A lot of my time is spent coordinating among cross-functional teams and across cross-cultural teams. And so apart from being a personal interest, it's something that I personally need to constantly stay on top of to keep learning more. And so today I'd like to share some of my learnings with you. Today, we're going to just briefly cover a lot of different topics. I'm sorry, I can't deep dive into any of these, but I hope to give you a um, sort of feeling for what each of these topics is and some resources. And so if you'd like to screenshot this, I've included a link to my slides that have further re reading resources at the end. So uh, hopefully you'll, your interest will be piqued and you'll want to read more later. We're going to be covering navigating cultural differences, improving feedback, active listening, and I'll share some of my favorite communication hacks. The first is navigating cultural differences, and this is really important in open source communities because they attract members from all over the world, or at least they should be attracting people from all over the world. And while there are many ways to look at cultural um, differences, I was recently inspired by a cross collaboration guide that GitLab had about um, this book called The Culture Map by Erin Myers. And what she does is that she's mapped uh, many different countries into seven different areas. Uh, these areas are communicating, evaluating, leading, trusting, disagreeing, scheduling, and persuading. And I've included the indicator sheet here. I'll go over a little bit um, about how it's used, but it's a really awesome way to think about how cultures are different. An example of this is communicating. There are cultures that are low context and some that are high context. The low context cultures value communication that is precise, simple, clear, and oftentimes repetition is used to avoid misunderstandings. Throughout my presentation, you'll probably see me do this because I am from a, a culture that is low context. And then high context cultures are ones that value sophisticated, nuanced, and layered language. Sometimes you have to read between the lines in order to fully understand the message. And so I have, um, uh, this is one of her indicators. And so we see the low context cultures and the high context cultures. And here what's interesting is that the US and the UK, which share the same language, English, still vary according to low and high context. So the UK is higher context than the US. And similarly, two countries that are very close that share borders, Germany and France, Germany is much lower context than France. And I've included some other countries from people that belong to the GNOME community so that you can see that a lot of our Asian cultures are tend to go um, in higher into the realm of high context. Another indicator is evaluating. And this is around direct negative feedback. These are cultures that value delivering feedback frankly, bluntly, and honestly. They don't soften their negative messages with positive ones. And absolutes are often used. So these are things like you always do this or completely, they're absolutes. Uh, negative feedback is also seen as acceptable in front of groups. So it's not always done in private. 
excuse me. For indirect negative feedback cultures, they deliver feedback very softly, subtly, and diplomatically. It's really important to have positive messages along with the negative ones. And you've probably already heard of the sandwich effect where you do positive, negative feedback, positive, and so it kind of softens the blow. Um, the feedback here is given in private. And so again, I've included a list of the different countries and where they lay along this indicator. Uh, Russia and Israel actually were um, called out in the book as being some of the um, highest in the direct negative feedback area, where it's def it's okay to give feedback in front of groups and um, the content, the, the feedback itself is very separated from the relationship. So it's um, seen as something much more acceptable to do there. Another indicator is persuading. And for this indicator, Aaron Myers hasn't finished mapping out all of the countries. And actually, some of the countries are neither principles first or applications first. So she hasn't included them. So we have included here a list of countries that um, have been plotted on this indicator line. Principles first cultures value the why first. They've been trained to develop the theory or the concept before presenting the facts and statements or opinions. So it's really important to understand why. For applications first cultures, they value the how and the what first. So they're trained to begin with the facts, statements, opinions, and then back it up uh, um, as necessary. And so with this, with applications first cultures, you often see executive summaries or again, like bullet points and then follow up afterwards. Oh, and something that I wanted to mention is that the book says that um, oftentimes there's friction where, for example, if somebody from France um, is uh, managed by somebody in the US and they're constantly asked to keep doing things, but they're not given the why, it can become very frustrating. And so it's really important to understand these cultural differences in order to adapt the messaging and adapt to the person that you're speaking to, because they just might have different values in terms of what to talk about first. So it's, it's a really cool insight to have. All right, well, I said that I can't go into all of the different indicators. I thought it would be fun to map out some of the cultural backgrounds that we see in the GNOME Foundation Board of Directors. And I'll just focus in on one of these. This is, um, first of all, what a map looks like. And you can find that tool on Erin Meyer's website. Um, it is behind a paywall, but um, she has a lot of really great content there. And so um, one of the indicators, for example, disagreeing, here using my laser pointer, um, you can see that all of the uh, cultures represented are pretty much in the middle. There's no uh, extreme outliers or, you know, um, but even here you can kind of see the, the inclinations um, where Nigeria is a culture that values confrontation more so than cultures, uh, the Mexican culture. And so, um, this is just, again, a really cool insight to have as the board of directors even does their work of how they may fit in within all of these separate indicators. Okay, there's a lag between my slides. Here we go. All right, improving feedback. Feedback is something that is extremely important and I've included this grumpy cat image because getting feedback also, like, often makes us grumpy. Uh, it's oftentimes makes us react in a certain way that, you know, while we understand that feedback is good for us, it's not always pleasant to have it and it can be challenging. But I'd like to say that giving and receiving feedback is a skill that we can build. So even if you feel like, you know, you're not there yet, that you react really strongly and you feel kind of hopeless even in the fact that you just react really um, strongly to negative feedback. It's something that you can work on. 
And something to be that's really helpful is being aware of underlying biases or tendencies, because as we just learned, there are real cultural differences that exist and we need to be aware of. And then we're also influenced by our own stereotypes and biases. So we need to make sure that we're keeping that in mind. And I want to say feedback is a good thing. Feedback seeking behavior has been linked to higher job satisfaction, being more creative and adapting to things more quickly. And specifically seeking out negative feedback is associated with higher performance. Oh, this lag. Okay. <laughs> uh, but receiving negative feedback is tough. And I just want to acknowledge that. We feel bad emotions more strongly than we feel the good ones because our brains are, are wired to detect threats and help us survive. And the negative feedback is kind of triggers those instincts of like, this negative feedback is like a cheetah and it's going to eat me. And we just go into fight, flight, or freeze mode. And we can have a real physical attract, uh, a reaction to the negative feedback. So here's some tips for when you start to feel that way. The first thing is that it's really important to take some time. This is definitely an okay thing to do. You don't need to respond immediately. We often do get defensive or angry when we first hear it, and we need to process the feedback. To help with creating that time, you can create a script. And while it may seem a little bit cheesy or forced at the beginning, you can just keep repeating it to yourself, you know, Thanks for the feedback. I'm going to take some time to process it and we'll come back to you later. And you can make this phrase your own, but having something that you can go to really helps you when you're put into these situations and your head is just, you know, going, just thinking, 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 and kind of spiraling out of control. Having a prepared script will really help you um, in these instances. And then if you notice that there's a physical reaction, just focus on your on your body. Um, your heart rate might become elevated or you'll feel a lot of pressure in your head and you need to start to ground yourself. So there's a really cool breathing technique, the 444, where you breathe in for four, you hold it for four, and then you exhale for four. And you can try this a few times, perhaps four times, and see if it starts to ground you. It'll help you kind of get back into your more grounded state. And then this is the most important thing. The reason to ground yourself is to be able to process that feedback. You need to ask yourself, what is true about what you heard? What do you think is biased or incorrect? And what can you use to help you improve or to make progress? Another really helpful thing is to identify your triggers. Why is this causing you to react this way? There are three triggers that are identified in a book that I really like called Thanks for the Feedback, The Science and Art of Receiving Feedback Well. And there's the truth trigger, which is set off by the substance of the feedback itself. This means the actual content. We somehow feel that it's wrong, that it's biased, that it's not true. There are relationship triggers that are set off by a particular person who is giving us the feedback. It's with it's triggered by that relationship. And so it fo the, our focus shifts, shifts from the feedback itself to the relationship with the person. We might think they're unqualified to give me this feedback or I feel betrayed by this person or any other number of things that make you focus more on the relationship itself than the feedback. And then there are identity triggers, and these cause us to question our sense of identity. We might feel overwhelmed or threatened, ashamed, off balance, and we no longer know what to think of ourselves. This can cause us to turn into kind of people trying to just survive. So by understanding our triggers, it's really useful in helping us to process our feelings and to be able to, again, ground ourselves and get ourselves down to the stage of being able to actually process and ask ourselves what it is that you are going to use to help you move forward. All right. 
I don't have a lot of time to go into giving tips for feedback, um, but into giving the feedback, but I do want to mention some important things, uh, a couple of basic things. Again, the book says that when you're giving feedback, that it's really helpful to think about the specific type of feedback that you'd like to give. By trying to figure out exactly what type you're giving, it, it, it creates less um, room for you know, just saying something that might actually be hurtful or that might not be helpful or what you really meant to do. So evaluate it through these three things. There's feedback, evaluation feedback, which helps the other person understand where they are and the expectations that you have for them. There's coaching feedback, which helps them to improve. And there's positive feedback or appreciation, which motivates and encourages. And all three of these things are really important to have. These are the things that really help people make progress. And all of them are equally important. So don't forget the positive feedback or any of the other ones. I also wanted to mention this cool trick that I found or, um, at a workshop that I attended where they were talking about connecting your right and left uh, side of the brains. Uh, of the brain. Um, and it, what you do is you say, when I think it makes me feel. And so um, an example of this might be when I think that you are ignoring me in chat when I direct message you, it makes me feel like I am unimportant or it makes me feel hurt. It makes me feel unappreciated and unimportant. And so by phrasing this, it uh, the I think this is happening, it's not accusing you of like, hey, whenever this happens, you're being a jerk. It's more like when I think that this is happening, you're focusing on the behavior, then it makes me feel this way. And it really focuses on, on your experience. And so then it allows you to come together with that other person to talk it through. Uh, I've tried this out in a few interpersonal relationships, and I found that it works pretty well. It feels a little bit weird at first to specifically use those words when I think it makes me feel, but when you get a little bit more comfortable using it, it can be really powerful. And then this next point is maybe obvious, but not maybe not so much. Um, remember to talk to the right person in the right at the right place at the right time, and. What this means is that if you have a conflict with person A, don't talk to person B about it. That's not the way to resolve it. The best way is to really talk to person A about it. So identify the right person and really make, you know, again, maybe reaching out to them as they're running off, um, you know, at the end of a work day or just, you know, at the end of their day at all. Um, ask for some time and make sure that it's in a private place perhaps so that you can really um, have a conversation and work this out. And so just a quick tip, I know we talked about cultural differences, but it's important to, uh, it's safe to, I would say, give negative feedback in private and give positive feedback in public. That always makes people feel really great. The next thing I want to talk about is active listening, because communication is not just about talking. It's about listening just as well as maybe even more importantly. And I love this quote by Richard Carlson that says, being heard and understood is one of the greatest desires of the human heart. I think that all of us really long to have this, to be heard and understood and somebody listening to you really well is a way to uh, help us feel that way. So maybe some of you have heard this before while you're in a conversation with somebody and you're listening and they say, I just, I don't feel like you're listening to me. And you're able to repeat exactly what they said, but they still feel like you're not listening. And this confuses both sides of the people or frustrates both people. You know, it could be um, you feel like maybe you're listening and the other person just does not feel heard. And so I'd like to talk about the different types of listening. And, and you can start to analyze how you are listening to each conversation. 
So the first one is pretty obvious, distracted listening. This is when you're multitasking, preoccupied, you know, kind of not really fully there with the person. There's content listening, which is listening to the facts and planning how to respond. So this might be somebody is responding or is saying something and you hear something and you're like, oh, I want to talk about this. And you start to formulate your answer. And in the process, you're not really listening to what else they're saying. You're not encouraging them to keep talking. Then there's identifying listening where you respond with some a similar situation. So this might be your friend that says, oh, I'm so excited. I'm going to go to Croatia next month and they want to tell you all about it. And you say, wow, Croatia, I love Croatia. I went there last year. We went to this place, to that place. I love that. Don't do this. And you've started talking. You're no, you're no longer listening. You kind of switch the dynamic there. And so remember to instead, you know, you might be really excited about sharing your experience, but first give your friend time to share theirs. And so you might say, oh, Croatia, tell me about that. And that I, I've been there too. And um, encourage them to speak. And then at the end, you might say, well, if you want any tips on what I did, I'd be happy to share them. And that provides an opportunity for them to ask more and listen to you. The next type of listening is problem solving. And this is something that we often do. Um, we really want to help people. And so we listen with the intent of providing feedback or ideas on how to solve the situation. And sometimes people might just not be ready for this type of listening, or maybe when you're doing it, you're ignoring some of the feelings associated, you're focusing on the facts, or you're, you're bringing in your perspective uh, sooner than might be needed. So oftentimes when we're listening, um, we can default into this. And so I want to say that active listening is sort of the gold standard for how to listen. This is when you hear both the facts and the feelings, and you can respond appropriately to both. And so I just really want to repeat that again. It's active listening is when you hear facts and feelings, and you respond appropriately to both. And so this is where people really start to feel heard and understood. And it's what we should all aspire to be uh, as listeners. No, let's say you have three minutes left plus oh. questions. Oh my gosh. Okay. So I, I'm probably not going to get through all of this, but I do want to say active listening is where how you do it is that you show simple signals and simple questions. And these are both physical and verbal cues. Much like a stoplight tells you to stop, go, or yield, our actions and words do the same. So having body language that's eye contact, you know, facing each other, that shows somebody that we're there. Similarly, verbal cues like, really? Oh, tell me more. Oh, so your grandmother did this. What happened next? Those are all things that encourage people to keep going and continue speaking. And paraphrasing is another really important tool. It's so powerful. Paraphrasing is not just repeating back exactly what the person has said, but taking the key message and rephrasing it and rewording it in order to make sure that both people are on the same page. When you do this, it might be that the speaker says, oh, that's actually not what I meant to say. What I meant to say is this, sorry for the confusion. Or you might just show that you really do hear and understand the other person. So this also means that you don't have to be in agreement. You could say, okay, so what I hear you saying is that you'd like to have the GNOME logo be a flying donkey. Is that right? You might not agree with that, but you've now stated it. The other person's like, yeah, that's exactly it. And maybe that leads to closure because when people feel heard and understood, they really... Um, through paraphrasing, it might that might even just be enough. All right, so in the, um, I think this is the last bit that we have time for, but active listening is really important for building relationships. Uh, you can employ this in the virtual world, the principles of this in the virtual world, but it, more importantly, you should use them in in-person um, at events that you have or, um, you know, places where you have in-person interaction because the relationships then carry over into the online world.
I don't have time to share my favorite hacks, I think, or I don't know, Manuel, it, it's like two pages. Let's see if I can do this really quickly. Um, basically, one of them is just that when you're writing, um, it's the writer's job to be understood. So make sure that you have the right formatting. I really love doing a skim test, making sure that you can easily th read through it and that the key messages are easy to find that call to actions are very clear and you say who needs to do it by when. Um, this yes and principle where instead of, you can disagree with somebody, but by using this simple phrase, instead of saying no or yes but, it really helps to keep the collaboration going because it helps you to acknowledge the person and then continue with your own thought. Um, this is my last slide and it's collaborative phrases. Um, this is just a list of some that help you collaborate with others. How might we do this? Might I suggest we blah? Uh, what are your thoughts? All of this list is really useful when you're talking to people and encourages multiple perspectives and just cross collaboration. I have uh, my final quote, I just wanted to end with um, a quote by John Powell, which is, communication works for those who work at it. And this is really important. This is a skill that you can build. And so the more you practice it, the more you read about it, the better you'll become. And I hope that my presentation has given you at least some uh, foundation or some sparked some new interests. Um, giving you new ideas so that you can uh, progress in your journey of better communication and collaboration. All right, that is all. This slide just has some references and resources, um, some of the books and articles that I've mentioned. And with that, thank you. And here's a link to my slides again in case you want to um, take a closer look at some of the things that I've talked about. So much noted. See, I have forgotten you some questions. Maybe you can ask them, um, answer them in Are Rocket they? Chat since we ran out of time. Okay, sure. Where do I see the questions? I I will forward forward them Perfect. to you. Okay, great. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you. See you later.